When it comes to investigating a problem on a PC, Process Monitor is a great tool. But in this case, we needed to run it for a very long period of time, and there are some practicalities around that, both in terms of running Process Monitor and in terms of starting and stopping it. So we learned a lot of lessons in this particular project, and I thought I'd share those with you. So the problem that the customer had was that they had a document management system. They were saving documents into that system and intermittently those documents would save with a zero byte length. And so all work was lost. And it was a very low frequency problem. It only happened about once every two weeks. Uh, in fact, a user, an individual user could go um, a month without seeing the problem. And to complicate matters, in the Word, within Word, they had many add-ins and plugins installed. Uh, this is quite common, we find, in legal companies where they have things like template management systems and um, they have the document management system client and there were some other add-ins, some custom designed add-ins as well. The system looked like this. We have the user's PC with Word, as I said, and plugins and uh, the DMS client. Then we have the DMS application server. We have a database that contains metadata for the documents that are stored in the DMS. And we have a file store, um, which is just a straightforward SMB server, which actually saves the files. The data flows are mainly between the PC and a particular directory which is called NR Portable. It doesn't really matter, but it's a local directory on the C drive of the PC. And then we have traffic that flows to port 1081 on the DMS server. And that's the file port. And what happens is that we actually send saved document data to that port. What we discovered was that when Word closes a document after it's been modified, the template management system would intercept the close and it would fiddle around with the document. Then um, the DMS client would get involved and then a, a user or a customer built plugin. And all of these different pieces of software had the opportunity to change attributes with the file or even um, delete all the data associated with the file. And of course, the uh, customer didn't have any idea which one of these plugins was actually giving a problem. Now the file goes through several stages which we'll see in a minute in a trace and what we wanted to do was capture all of the interactions with both the local C drive and with port 1081. So let's have a look at process monitor tracing the normal operation of the updating of a file and then the saving back into the document management system. Now let me start by explaining the filtering that was applied to capture this data. You can see that it's a relatively no, low number of events. If you've ever start, started Procmon on a PC without any filtering, you'll know that it will record hundreds of thousands of events very quickly. But this has quite a tight filter. And you can see the filter is just looking at all interactions with the winword.exe process, or any winword.exe process is actually, to be more correct. And within that, we want to see any activity to the NR portable directory. And also we want to see activity to the DMS ports. And we can do all of this by entering appropriate path filters. What we've also done is we've excluded profiling events, process and thread events, and any registry interactions. I simply want to see the file system activity and the TCP IP activity. Now here in this first entry, we see an indication of the file names that are used. So although a file has a normal name, like it could say uh, case 345, the document management system abstracts itself from associating the file name with the actual file as it's stored on the file store, and it uses a serial number. So we have a serial number followed by a revision number. 
So there's the, this is the serial number and it, this is revision number two. Now in this trace, I've put some bookmarks into the trace so that we can skip quickly to the information. So let's go down and look at the point where it starts to reference another revision of the document. So we can see these two entries here have, an, have, a, have a suffix of underscore three. And this is where Word and all its plugins are checking to see if revision three already exists. And you can see that the uh, success, the result code is name not found. So it doesn't exist at that point. Then what we find is that just like Word in normal operation, and, and you will see this if you trace Word working uh, without any of the DMS plugins, etc. Word actually saves a document to a temporary file first. And then after it's written out, and you can see it's doing file writes all the way down here, after it's written out all of the data, it then finally renames that temporary file to be the eventual file name. So over here we see that it re renames it to the same serial number, but with revision three this time. And then you can see that Word and all its plugins start to um, interact with revision three of the document. Bearing in mind, we haven't sent it across the network here yet. It's just uh, on the local C drive. Now we jump down to here and we see some interesting traffic. It reads in the document 4K at a time and it sends it to the file store to port 1081, as you can see here, and it sends it 4K at a time. It appears that it's read the whole document in and then sent the document. So in a, it looks like a two-step process. I don't think that's actually true. I think it's reading in 4K and then sending 4K. The reason it appears in this order is because the TCP entries only get logged when the data has been acknowledged. So when you've sent the 4K to the far end and it's sent back an acknowledgement, that's when we actually see the trace entry. This is just the information that we wanted, um, but there are some challenges as we'll discover. So if I just take us round to this point here. Now what I've done here is I've set up a script file um, to actually run process monitor. So if we just have a quick look at that script file, um, this first part of the code is just to create a date and time in a nice neat format that I then use in the file name. This is the this is where all the magic happens. So we invoke Procmon, we direct its output to um, a particular file in a directory called perflogs. We're automatically accepting the end user license agreement. We load up a pre-configured um, config file and we're going to run it minimized in the taskbar um, without any uh, interaction with the user. So that's ideal, but we'll see that there's a problem. So if I just run this. Now, of course, the problem is that if you want to run process monitor, you have to run it with admin rights. If I quickly put in the admin rights here, you can see that the script has run and we can indeed see down here in the taskbar that process monitor is running and we can actually maximize it and, and view it. It's not capturing anything because the uh, filters are uh, looking for WinWord and NR Portable, and I don't have that on this particular machine. But it started up correctly as it should. But the problem is, of course, that if we wanted to deploy this to users all around an organization and to run it for a long period of time, we would literally have to either give the user the admin rights or we'd have to go and visit every desk every time the user started their PC, which obviously is not practical. Now, the way around this is to actually start it with a scheduled task. So if I look at task scheduler, oops, just here, and I'm going to run task scheduler as a one-time thing with admin rights. So let's define the scheduled task. 
We come into here and we say create new task. I'm going to call it procmon start. We need to run as the administrator account and we can change it for any other account by pressing this button over here. But just remember that whichever account it runs under must have admin type rights so that um, it can actually run procmon. We want to run it whether the admin user is logged on or not. And we want to run with the highest privileges. We also set this to be the correct operating system. And now we need to specify how this task is to be triggered. And we're going to trigger it at log on time. So when a user logs on. And then we have to say the action that's going to be taken. So we do want to start a program, but we're actually going to do it with a script. Now note that we have to go into the, you, you may find that the desktop I've got, I'm using the uh, script that I have on the desktop, but it's for the user. So just remember that you have to make sure you're going to the user's desktop or if that's where you've put the actual um, files. So this is the file we're going to run. And then we have some conditions that we can set, and I'm not really interested in those. I certainly don't want it to obey anything to do with AC power. And then there are some final settings. One of the things, I don't want it to start a new instance if there's already an instance running. Um, stop longer than three days. I might change that actually, but we'll just leave that for the moment. Um, and everything else can be left to default actually. So we then say OK to that. Now it's prompting us now because we're telling Windows to run something as admin. So obviously it wants to be sure that you, it has the right to do that. So it, we get this prompt here for the task scheduler. And we should be good to go. So now we have the scheduled task ready here. And actually I can test it by just running it. Now, you'll notice down here that uh, before, when I showed you this on my own PC, that we saw that we had a process monitor running task in the taskbar. We don't have that here. And the reason is because actually it's running under an admin account in the background in an invisible window. Now we can prove it by going into task manager and if we look just here, you can see that Process Monitor is indeed running under the administrator account. So that's how we get it started. Now the problem is, how do you stop it? We've tried all sorts of things. We tried Procmon Terminate, which is actually a command line uh, way of stopping, supposedly stopping all instances of Procmon, but we found that didn't work. We tried stopping it using another scheduled task, but that didn't work either. You could, of course, just kill it in Task Manager. But the trouble is that when you end Procmon normally, it finalizes its trace files. If you just kill it through Task Manager, you end up with corrupt trace files. So the way around this is to actually shut the PC down. If you do a shutdown and a restart, what happens is that it gracefully shuts down Procmon in the background. And then when we restart, because I have a script that um, starts with different names uh, based on time of day. So if we look in here, I've got all this uh, calculation here and then I end up generating um, a trace file name with date and time in it. Because I then end up with unique trace files, I don't have a problem with corrupting the files and I don't have a problem with overwriting them. So Procmon is ideal, but it requires elevated rights. Users don't have appropriate rights normally and um, I, it, it would be unusual in any large organisation for users to have a, those types of rights. Visiting every desk every time we want to start Procmon to respond to the user account control dialogue would be totally impractical. 
Terminate doesn't work, and killing Procmon corrupts the trace file. So we've seen that starting Procmon with task scheduler and then restarting the PC to retrieve the trace files is a way around this problem. And you can imagine that if it's capturing for a long period of time and it's, you've got a nice tight filter and it's not capturing too much data, the user doesn't have to immediately restart their PC. They can restart it at their own convenience. It's just that once they restart the machine, it will release those Procmon files. So in summary, we can start Procmon with a scheduled task. We can set an option to leave existing Procmon tasks running on logon. And when the problem occurs, we can ask the user to restart the PC at their convenience and then retrieve the Procmon traces.